Welcome to the History of the Papacy podcast, a podcast about the history of the popes of Rome and Christian Church. Prepare yourself to step behind the ropes and leave the official tour of the story of the popes and Christianity. I am your host, Steve Guerra, and I thank you for joining me on this journey. You can find show notes, how to contact me, sign up for our mailing list, and how to support the history of the papacy by going to our website, a2zhistorypage.com. Two great ways to support the history of the papacy are leaving your ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. And another really great way to support the history of the papacy is by going and joining us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash history of the papacy. Your support on Patreon goes a long, long way to help keep the history of the papacy sustainable for a long time in the future. There are four tiers of support on Patreon. Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. Each of these tiers represents one of the traditional patriarchates of early Christianity. There are many great benefits to you for supporting the show on Patreon. You will receive early and advertisement-free content, bonus episodes, monthly book drawings, and most importantly, you will be included on the history of the papacy diptychs. In traditional Christianity, the diptychs are the lists of bishops commemorated in order of their precedence. The sooner you sign up on Patreon, the higher you'll be on the lists of the history of the papacy patrons. Now let us commemorate the Patreon patrons on the History of the Papacy Diptychs. We have Roberto, Joran, William B., Brian, Jeffrey, Christina, John, Sarah, and Judy at the Alexandria level. We have Dapo, Paul, Justin, Lana, John, Steve, and Sean, all of whom are magnificent at the Constantinople level and reaching that ultimate power and prestige, that of the Sea of Rome. We have Peter the Great, Alex the Great, Amma the Great, Frederick the Great, and Jeffrey the Great. And with that, here is the next piece of the mosaic of the history of the Popes of Rome and Christian Church. The Irredentists, they don't achieve their full power right now. They will have to wait until World War I. Um, but basically, the Terra Irredente is the unreconciled Italian lands. This is anywhere where Italians live, where they're under the control of of a foreign power. So they believe that Nice, Savoy, parts of Switzerland, um, parts of the Dalmatian coast, Istria, uh, Malta, North Africa, all these places were rightfully Italian. The fact that Italy didn't have it was a a, a grievance that needed to be uh, needed to be corrected or or else Italy would remain this poor, backward nation. these initial stirrings were started by a guy named uh, D'Annunzio, who became the leader of the Futurist Party, uh, and in the future would be one of the main supporters of Benito Mussolini's fascist party. So the, this period starts around here, uh, where people are getting more bellicose toward France, and there's a lot more shakeup in the world. Um, in Italy itself, the agricultural situation and the industry were just starting to get adjusted. Agriculture was, for the most part, a complete mess. It was uh, a guy named Agostino Bertani, who was one of the main uh, forefathers of the Italian Risorgimento. He he brought to light the fact that 15,000 people were living Mesolithic lives outside Rome. I mean, living inside literal caves. Uh, which were polluted with malaria. People were were dying by the thousands in these places. And this shocked even disinterested backbenchers who who had, who had no idea that this was happening. They thought the south of Italy was, was the breadbasket that they always read about in their Roman history from a thousand years ago. It wasn't the case. Italian uh, agriculture was entirely subsistence-based almost. It, it, you, as a farmer had only so much land that you could um, grow your crops in. Uh, If you had one failed harvest, it usually meant you had to sell all your land and to a much larger landowner. 
and end up being destitute or end up working on the land you used to own. It was a real, it was a real problem. Um, industry was just growing too. There was the Pirelli tires, which are still made, were founded in Milan at around this time in the 1880s, as well as, well as uh, electrical cables for, for power lines. It was one of the first uh, places in the world to actually construct these power lines in Milan. Um, there, this was the start of Fiat. This was the start of the the Turney, um, the the Turney steel mills. This is they they got pig iron from the rest of Europe at very very low cost, and they were able to pump out Italian steel. And even though they had very little natural resources within the peninsula itself, it became uh, a, an indispensable part of the Italian economy, and it it called for millions and millions of dollars in uh, uh, government subsidies to even keep it afloat. It became a, a point of contention for a lot of people. Um, so as I was saying, the main partners were France. Uh, and with everything going on in the world, this started to change. Um, there were a group of Italian uh, mine workers who were murdered in France. They were transient workers. Um, this, this sparked outrage across the country. The, the Like I was saying, the invasion of Tunisia was a huge blow to Italian, you know, North African aspirations. And they were increasingly, they increasingly found themselves at odds with France, whether it was geopolitically or economically or, or, or any other ways. Likewise, um, relations with Austria, the classic enemy of Italy, were sort of going back to a, a good spot. Umberto's mother and grandmother were both Austrian princesses. So he, it behooved him to kind of keep a, a, a good handle on Austrian relations. He visited, famously, he visited the, the Tyrol region or, and Vienna. Um, and likewise, the Kaiser visited Venice. This supposedly buried the hatchet from 1866. Um, on top of all this, there, were, there was an immense problem with the merchant marine of Italy. Their merchant marine consisted almost entirely of um, sail ships, where almost everyone else had steamships. The, and with the opening of the, the, um, the Suez Canal, which was worked on almost exclusively by Italian workers, uh, wheat prices collapsed. So a lot of Italian farmers withheld their grain because it cost so much to export it and then send it to the market and pay for all the different uh, duties on all the... It was, it was too much to even sell it. So people were starving because... And grain was still just growing right there in front of everyone's face. It said, well, why can't we get this grain? They're like, oh, well, it won't be economical for us. So a lot of Italian peasants just simply went on to an unproductive plot of land and just started growing. They just started growing food for them, their family, at, at the anger of the landlords. But they, there wasn't really much you could do once this happened. I mean, you could throw the guy out, but then he's pissed off. His family's pissed off. You've made a lifelong enemy. And this is the this is the circle. This was the vicious circle that was Italian life. I mean, is it's not any wonder that uh, ten million people probably left Italy. Uh, yeah, this is the height of it, where people from Italy, and it's mostly the south, if I'm not mistaken, go to North America, South America, and then other parts of Europe, or really predominantly to the Americas. It's, I mean, that that sort of, sort of thing. I mean, you can compare it to the Irish uh, who left during the potato famine. I mean, there still has to be ripples of that sort of migration to this day. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, just for example, and it wasn't just. Um, uh, external migration. It was internal migration. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Southern Italians went North, usually them carrying everything they owned on a box on their shoulder. This was, this, this was the way, I mean, you can look at a movie like, uh, a really great movie for, um, people who want to understand how Italy sort of worked during this time, even though it's a, a more modern movie, it, it's called the bicycle thieves. If you've ever heard of it. It's one of the great, uh, to me, one of the great films ever made. It, it takes place directly after World War II. It's about this guy and his bicycle. His bicycle gets stolen. And the rest of the movie is him trying to find his bicycle, which is his whole world. I mean, his job depends on this bicycle. His livelihood depends, depends on his bicycle. His, uh, his health depends on this bicycle. A and this was the way. I mean, some little things like this were made entire Italians' lives. 
and losing something like that, like your plot of land or, or your bicycle or, or, you know, family member, uh, or, or an arm or something. These were, these were basically death sentences. Steve here again. We are a member of the Parthenon Podcast Network, featuring great shows like Chris Mowery's Vlogging Through History and many other great podcasts. Go over to Parthenon Podcast to learn more. And now here's a quick word from our sponsors. Well, so we see that Italy is massively transforming in this time peoples are moving migrations where do we meet move forward into the into the 20th century into really uh modernity so the main thing that happens augustino di prentis is still the the prime minister on again off again there's a bunch of different people who are prime minister at this time so it's kind of a moot point to say who's the prime minister uh because this is like year and a half there's a new prime minister year and a half there's a new prime minister it's basically the the formula um, what really happens is in Ethiopia, uh, on the Masao shore and the shores of, of, of the Red Sea, uh, an entire contingent, 500 Italian soldiers are completely wiped out, uh, by Ethiopian warlords. Um, this was such a shock to, to De Prentis. It, it said he aged 10 years in the day before it happened. Like a, a, he showed up shaking in, in parliament with a, an almanac to try and explain what happened. This battle is called Dogali. Even though there's no place on any map that's called Dogali in that area, the the Italian foreign minister said, "Oh, the battle happened at some place called Dogali," and that was that stuck. That was the name that stuck. Um, this led to one of the the first Ethiopian wars. This war was mostly against um, one of the Ethiopian subjects. His name was Raz Alula. He was the Mad Raz of of Ethiopia. He fought everybody. He fought the people in Sudan, he fought the people in Italy, he fought people in Ethiopia, he fought everybody. Um, eventually, he's defeated. Um, and this first thing, Dogali, leads to the death of De, De Prentis. He's completely destroyed by this whole event. He's dead within a few months. And the guy who's put in charge is Francesco Crispi. Now, Francesco Crispi, he used to be uh, Garibaldini. He, he fought with Garibaldi. Um, in, in Sicily, uh, uh, he, he was, uh, indispensable in making like bombs for the kingdom of Sicily in 1848. But when, um, Italian unity is declared, he quickly changes his tune. He puts his power entirely behind the monarchy. He says famously, a Republic would divide us. The monarchy makes us strong. And this, um, this was one of the first official switch ups of his life. He would switch up so many different times throughout the course of, uh, 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 of his, uh, political career. Uh, he was an imperialist. He was, uh, anti-French and he was a nationalist to the, to the 10th degree. He, he hated France. He believed that France was the reason why Italy was in such a state as it was. I mean, who invaded Tunisia, France, who, uh, who stopped when we were about to take Venice, it was France. I mean, uh, who prevented us from taking Rome? France. It, this was the this was the thing he put forward. And with him as prime minister, he starts a trade war with France. This tanks the exports that go there. I mean, literally just um, uh, annihilates them. They need to find new trade partners for the tens of millions of dollars in in exports that they have, and they can't send it to France anymore. So uh, they have to send it to, you know, Germany, they send it to send it to Austria, they send it to all these different places. Um, with it, the, the Italian economy just collapses. It falls into a very, very, very deep recession. And Crispy, instead of being vilified, seen as like some pariah who didn't really know what he was doing, he's loved for it. it, it it's very hard to, you know, bring up a, a, a similar, uh, person like him in history. I know it's very probably cliche to do this now, but really Trump is one of the few people you could really compare to Crispy in the terms of his, his nationalism, in the terms of his, uh, his protectionism, his, uh, his outlook on, on, on world events, that they were very, very, very similar, at least somewhat. And, and to 
imagine Crispy, think of Otto von Bismarck, literally, with no eyebrows. That's literally what he looked like. He literally looked like Otto von Bismarck with no eyebrows. And this was intentional. This was in part to foster relations between the two countries. I mean, he loved Germany. He thought uh, Helmut von Moltke, the German uh, chief of staff, was one of the greatest military minds in human history, which is probably fair. But um, through this trade war and nationalist risings and, and resentment, the things are the things are in a complete, complete standstill. They're in a very strange spot. And to if you let me, I would love to quote Villari. He was a, this is from the book Modern Italy by Dennis Max Smith. Villari was a conservative um, at the time. And this is what he says the real problem with Italy is. It is high time that Italy begin to realize that she has inside herself an enemy which is stronger than Austria. Somehow we must face up to our multitude of illiterates, the ineptitude of our bureaucratic machine, the ignorance of our professors, the existence of people who in politics are mere children, the incapacity of our diplomats and generals, the lack of skill in our workers, our patriarchal system of agriculture, and on top of all, the rhetoric which gnaws our very bones. I mean, that guy puts into perspective all the problems of Italy. This is the reason it's not working is because there's people who are acting like children, they're petulant, they're in charge. And on top of this, the, the, the way that they handle things is completely backwards. It was medieval, the way that they um, went about agriculture and, and, and even the initial industries had to be completely subsidized by the government at the expense of regular people. It, was, it wasn't the, the way that things should have been done. And Bellari notices that right away, and he puts it very incredibly eloquently to me. It, it seems like with Italy, it was so difficult for them to form a nation because you just, you had so many different groups and they never really had somebody to mush them all together and force to play along, or at least yeah. it, when they tried, it just never really worked. Yeah. You know, they didn't have like in Germany, these, the idea that we maybe that in Germany, and I mean, it's a kind of over way oversimplifying it, but it's happened. There's an idea that we all really should be one people and we'll, we'll all start pulling the oars in the same direction. As much as they tried that in Italy, it just never really panned out. Yeah. The, the one person who could have really done what you're talking about, bring the country together, was probably Cavour. Um, but Cavour, he died right away. He died in March of 1861, like right after unity was declared. And, and the power went to, to much less um, you know, smart individuals, people who didn't have the gumption or the ability to do what Cavour did. I mean, Cavour was able to keep together a, a multi- ideological alliance of left, right, center for 10 years, something like that, which is unheard of in Italian politics. Um, maybe someone else who could have done that was Garibaldi. But Garibaldi was not someone who wanted to run the country. He just wanted to, you know, set, set it up and, and then watch it from the sidelines and, and, and let it happen. He, one of the few things he wanted to do was, um, you know, change the course of the Tiber, which would have put a stamp on the new nation to him, and it would have stopped a lot of the malaria that was spreading all over Rome at the time. It was one of the reasons why King Victor Emmanuel died. So it, it, it's true. There was, no, there was no person like that. The, and Crispy, he attempted to be that. He was, at least in theory, this unifying figure. He was the first Sicilian prime minister, which is super unheard of. I mean, some politicians didn't even want him to accept the, the job. He did, they didn't want him there because he was Sicilian. He said to do that would be ridiculous. I'm the most Unitarian guy you've ever seen. And he, he proved that over and over again. I mean, he took away the voting rights of hundreds of thousands of socialists just because they were socialists. He, he, he stopped, um, you know, he stopped newspapers that he couldn't bribe. If he, and this was a very well laid out thing. This was something that was practiced for a very, very long time before Crispy. I mean, the right was uh, bribing politicians and, and newspaper men, just like the left was. So it wasn't much, it wasn't much difference between one or the other. But yeah, the, the phenomenon that was Crispy and his popularity is, is something that I think um, probably could do with a little bit more research into. 
Uh, he was such an interesting character. And he was so interesting because of his contradictions. I mean, a Democrat who supported the monarchy, a Southerner who supported Northern interests, uh, uh, you know, there were all these different things that were going on. And with his rise to power, he attempted right away to start a war with France. Like uh, 1888, he, um, he wanted to start a war with them to coincide with the, the centennial of France. Around the same time, 100 years previous, the French Revolution began. Um, he wanted to do this with Germany and they almost do, they, they almost do do it. But the way they try to start the war is through, a, a troop, um, review right at the border between France and Germany. So it was obviously a bellicose move. People in France were pissed at it, but they, they didn't end up pushing all the way toward war. It was just too obvious what was going on. And afterwards, uh, Crispy says, Look, I would never try to start a war. Anyone who tries to start another war would be committing a crime against humanity. He literally says that, which is, is really funny because he really does. He tries again in 1892 when he's um, not in power to start another war with the pretext that he believes. And in fact, he knows the France are going to land a massive army in Genoa and then march inland from there and conquer all of Italy. This was how he wants to start starts his second war. Um, but he's removed from power because a year previous, he sends secret feelers out to France for an alliance. So uh, <laughs> all over the place. This yeah, guy. It's, a, it's a it's a real he's a really funny, interesting guy. Steve here again with a quick word from our sponsors. On top of this, there's the. Another massive scandal. This was the, the big, big one. This was the banking scandal of the 1890s. This involved everybody. I mean, everybody was involved in this. Uh, the, the bank, uh, um, the Bank of Romania, they, they would print money over the state's head to bribe people with. Uh, on, on top of this, they would give out millions of dollars in, in you know, interest free loans, namely to Crispy and to his cronies. But uh, when this first was revealed that these Banks were collapsing, mostly because French capital kept these banks running and the French didn't want anything to do with the Italians anymore. They would just take their money out and cause the banks to fail. Once this was found out, Crispy very slyly pushed it under the rug. He made sure it wasn't going to be revealed anytime soon. He gets replaced by, um, at first, Di Rudini. He was another Sicilian, but he's a, a lot more conservative but he's not really that important. He resigns eventually. And Giolotti becomes the prime minister. Giolotti is a very important figure in the future of Italian politics. Right now, he's just starting out, but he was one of the, the truly, truly the most corrupt people maybe in history. He argued that as a tailor, you wouldn't try and uh, clothe someone who was handicapped. So with that same argument, you can't, run a democracy in Italy the same way you would run a democracy in a regular country. So this was his whole thing. But he wanted to use corruption for good. I mean, it's a very strange. Yeah, <laughs> he, he would set up the elections in a way where, you know, it would end up uh, it would end up, you know, ingratiating him and, and, and his friends. But he was truly a centrist. He did really want to, to fix things. Uh, and to show you the reality show nature of like parliament, this isn't the first time this has happened, but basically uh, he shows up after he gets removed from power um, with a bunch of, because he's accused of, of taking money from the Bank of Romania. He has to resign. He shows up like a week later with a bunch of documents, a bunch of letters, a bunch of reports that implicate Crispy almost directly. And not only that, they implicate Crispy's wife as being an adulterer. Like he has... Somehow he has hundreds of communiques between Crispy's wife and some other man. Like, I, I, how did he get these? I'm not sure. He doesn't. He doesn't say. It ends up being strange for him because he has to explain how he got all this stuff and why he didn't present it at the original investigation. But then Crispy he shuts down Parliament for good, almost. He and for six months, him and the king reign personally by by royal decree. I mean, even taxes are passed this way. Uh, this was uh, ir. ir irregular. This was undemocratic to the extreme. I mean, parliament wasn't even um, uh, considered in, in, in the exchange. Um, and since he's not able to 
start this war in Italy or er, in, in Europe. He wants to start a war anywhere else. I mean, he'd, he'd throw a, a dart on the board and he would start a war there. But one of the main places where there was still simmering tension was in Ethiopia. Before this war truly begins, though, back in Sicily, his home, home island, there's a massive, massive uprising. Um, this was uh, in part thanks to leftist agitation. These people in Sicily called themselves the Fasi, and Fasi in Italian means bundle. So they were the bundles, they were the bundlers. And these, uh, these uprisings happened mostly in places in Sicily, like I was saying, but in the mines especially. Sicily is known for citrus, but it's also known for having or used to have vast um, sulfur mines. My grandfather, where my great grandfather worked in one of these mines, for example, he worked from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. every day in these mines in the worst, most horrendous conditions you could imagine. He was a member of one of these um, one of these workers organizations. Uh, Crispy quickly declares martial law. He sends 40,000 Italian troops to Sicily. Um, Hundreds are executed. We don't know the exact number. Again, it's not it's not listed anywhere. It just says there are civilian casualties. <laughs> like that's what it says. Um, and and quickly he 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 shoots something like maybe thirty people, or the Italian army shoots maybe thirty people in three separate massacres. One of them happening in my grandparents' hometown in La Cata Fide. There, the uprising started after a seventeen-year-old boy was killed in the mines from a falling rock. Once he dies, the boss docked his pay for the rest of the day because he was dead. He can't work a shift anymore. But on top of that, he docked an hour pay for the rest of the crew for the time it took to fish this poor boy's body out of the ground. And, and once that happened, they said, OK, it's on. And they were chanting uh, down with taxes, you know, uh, long live Sicily, stuff like that. And from the, the upper echelon of town, these these uh, rich people would shout back death to the instigators. So it was quickly it was quickly put down. Eleven people were shot dead in La Cata Fide. No, the thirteen in two other places, I believe. Um, and the Fasi movement is basically more or less stomped down. I mean, it's it's held down for a very long time. This term Fasi obviously becomes fascist, which is you know, a, a bundler's, you know, bundle of sticks. Even the, the famous fascist symbol is, is a, a fist holding a, a bundle of arrows. And that's where that term comes from. 